Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Real Game Talk. If you just stumbled onto this podcast throughout the interwebs, I am sorry for you. But in Brazil, we tend to say that when it rains, you should get wet. Or something like that. Which means, please stick around to hear our awesome discussion about sort of random or pseudo random gaming related topics. Here, to my left or right, I don't know because he isn't here with me, the smartest Pokemon specialist in the internet, my favorite Colombian friend because I don't have a lot of them, the one and only Roberto Rubiano. Hey everyone, How, how's it going? Hey, how's it going, Roberto? Pretty good, pretty good. Pretty good? So, what have you been doing? How was your last week? Um, other than work, um, one of my friends from invited me over to play Persona 3, a game oh. I haven't played. That sounds exciting. He's so, a big fan of the whole uh, Shin Megami Tensei series, and he wants to get me into it. Right. I'm going to say something that probably going to get me crucified here. I never played any of those games. Should I? Yes. I only recently played uh, Persona 4, the Golden, on PS Vita, and I loved it. Right. I do own that. I still haven't got time to get to it, because it is a big time commitment. And for, like, like when I want to start a new game, I usually look through my men's catalog of backlog of games that I just need to play at one point. And I'm usually like, okay, I'm going to start this one that I can beat in like eight hours instead of this one that would take me 40. Uh, but I do want to, I really want to start that one eventually. I already got it downloaded on my PS Vita and everything. Interesting that you brought up the uh, PS Vita game, Roberto, because the PS Vita, last I heard, turned three years old, which means it's old enough to, oh, forget about it now. Uh, I was going to do a stupid joke, not the right place for it. <laughs> Uh, so the PS Vita released in Japan on December 17th, 2011, and then on the US, February 22nd, which means a few weeks ago, it turned three, uh, three years were passed since it released on the United States. So I, I like, I, I do own and love my Vita. I bought one last year. It took me a while to get around to it. And I do know you have one as well. Did you buy it, uh, during the time that you had just released or? It was definitely launch window, but it wasn't at launch. Right. And what got you excited to buy a PS Vita that close to the release? Well, I guess the addition of the, the extra thumbstick graphics upgrades, it seemed like we, they could really take handheld gaming to the next level. And they were also promoting, you know, streaming with PS3 and right. all that fun stuff. So it seems like you mostly got it for the device itself and not the games, which was probably usually the, the case for most of the people that bought the system, uh, especially back then, when there wasn't really a lot out. But although a lot of people don't recognize that, I feel like throughout the, the years, the PS Vita did build like a pretty decent library that at least I'm sort of very satisfied with. Although I, I do know like they do lack some like AAA titles here and there, but I've played like a, a lot of games that I've enjoyed. And that's kind of where I have to disagree with you, Dan. Oh, because okay. I mean, yes, it has a very nice library, but like you said, not a lot of those are original. A lot True. of them are very much ports or just upscales of other games. That's and it's kind of running yeah. dry to me, honestly. Yeah, at this point, especially, yeah, there's it's been a while since we have seen like major releases. A lot of people were talking about, I think it was Freedom Wars last year that supposedly was really good, but I didn't get around to playing that as well. Uh, granted, I did buy my PS Vita last year. It uh, I, hasn't even been an year yet. I think it's been like nine months or something. And I had PS Plus for a while, so I just had like that huge backlog of games that I got for free. Uh, and a few others that I bought with uh, the sales that they do very often and stuff. So I've been just like uh, slowly grinding through all the things that I have there. And that being said, good amount of the games that I've played and enjoyed on the system are available somewhere else. Right. So, yeah, I do give you that they don't have a lot of exclusives. Uh, one exclusive, though, that, well, sort of exclusive now, but that I, I did like a lot was initially uh, Velocity Ultra, which is kind of um arcadey uh, space shooter game or just like controlling a, like a spaceship throughout like multiple levels and Essentially, it's the kind of game that you just want to get better and better and keep like improving your overall score in each stage because 
essentially you can beat every stage not doing much or doing everything. You know, and I, I kept trying to go through and, and do everything. I wasn't able to. I'm not that good of a arcade player. And then later, Velocity 2X, which was essentially a, a sequel to that game, which I played on Vita last year, came out last year, and I loved it. But again, it is also available on PlayStation 4, at least at this point. So, yeah. And then Thomas Was Alone is also an indie game that I really appreciated. Bas- really like basic platforming game. Very minimalistic. All the, like, all the characters that you play are squares and they have different colors and different shapes. But depending on like the color, the shape and whatever, they have different personalities and a little bit of different skills. It was a fan platforming game, but then again, also available on PC. And many others. Yep. There are like a lot of, uh, I, I used my Vita especially for what I've used it for so far, just as my indie game machine. It's where I mostly play all those, uh, short, simple, minimalistic indie games that are usually available on PC because I already spend enough hours behind my PC that when I want to play one of those games, I, I kind of appreciate like me on this long thing. But as far as AAA big games go, I haven't played a lot of them. Which ones did you play a lot of, Roberto? I have to say Gravity Rush oh, being one yes. of the, I think it was either launch or launch window titles. That was very popular. I played a lot of that one as well. I love the mechanics and everything. I didn't beat it because it got to a point where it's just like too hard to me, at least. But that that was Casual. a pretty good game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was that Chris says to me, Roberto? You're call- you're calling me a casual player? <laughs> I'm somewhat yes. of a casual player. I do admit that. But oh, well, Gravity Rush did get very frustrating at some point, like because. I don't know, like, just the way the, like, those controls, they are super innovative and everything, but at the point that, like, I don't know, you just had to kill, like, this many enemies and, like, this huge boss at the same time, just, like, a lot of shit happening, I I just couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. I think I was, like, halfway through the game where it was just a boss battle that I tried it, like, ten times, couldn't make it, and I just dropped it. But up until that point, I was really liking the game, so I do recognize Gravity Rush as one of... On a PlayStation Vita's best, probably. Well, I, I do hope you go back to it. Because you okay. can just farm the jewels and level Cat up enough to the point where you can pretty right. much be any enemy in the game. Right, improve your skills enough so that... Because like, there's like the kill tree with a lot of different things that you could do and that kind of stuff. And remember that. Yeah. Let's see, what else? You didn't mention Persona 4 Golden. That's right. That's another one that's really good. Well, it is a port of the original Persona 4... It does add a lot more content. They add another character to the game. I don't know if you're familiar with how they do certain interactions that they call social links. Not so, big on it. I don't know. So outside of like the RPG combat style, you have sort of this kind of dating Japanese high school simulator, and you build relationships with people, and these are called social links. Hmm. And they boost your skills, and they help you in battle and whatnot. And it's, it's very interesting. So it's essentially a game that you'll get... Uh, the most off by playing with other people, is that what you mean? No, no, it, it, they're the characters inside the game. Oh, okay, oh, I'm do... sorry, I, I messed yeah. up. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Interesting. I do like Fire Emblem Awakening a lot, and I do know that it has nothing to do with the game and nothing to do with uh, uh, the Vita in general, but just the like the point that yeah, by building relationships between your characters, you can get better at battle, so I assume it's kind of a similar mechanic. That's just what yeah. I'm relating to in my head. Yes, so, actually, but um, Persona 4 is more uh, focused around the group of people you're with, whereas Fire Emblem, you just have this broad array right, of right. characters. Cool. So I assume like there's less characters, but way deeper uh, interactions and that kind of stuff, right? Very much so, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I, I have heard so much good stuff about this game that I do recognize I should play it. I just haven't yet because of the reasons that I talked about before. Uh, I think the... I just wanted to, to mention as well, I did play the Uncharted game on Vita. Did you ever get to play that? No, because I hadn't really dived into that series yet. Oh, okay. So you have not played any Uncharted game? Uh, the first one, a little bit. Oh, man, you're missing out. Because, like, the the first game, and honestly, the Vita one as well, they're nothing compared to what Uncharted 2 and Uncharted 3 are. And I actually, I just beat Uncharted 2. I had that on hold for a while. I have Uncharted 1 on hold as well. I only like 
three like three or four missions you completed or whatever but i think those games are amazing and granted like they're very they, they they're this very specific kind of game that's way more uh cinematic than anything else you you do a lot of like just watching and pressing x than than a lot of other stuff that's why people tend to criticize them a lot they're not that hard but at the same time just fucking naughty dogs uh ability to create such a uh, good looking environments and situations and just scripted sequences in the game is amazing to watch in my opinion so i do think those that series is a series worth playing for everyone even if you're not that big of a fan of the gameplay style i will say though uncharted 1 is very okay-ish in my opinion uncharted 2 and 3 were great and then the vita one had everything to be great as well in my opinion but it fell short because it tried to do too much of the like the touchscreen stuff I feel like because it was a lunch, lunch window game as well, they try to, to take the best out of all of the Vita capabilities and, and show off all of the things that the Vita could do. That's something we see very often. And because of that, I feel like there was a lot of gimmickies with, oh, you have to touch the screen to do this or whatever. You have to like rub it on the back to do whatever else, you know? D did you play a lot of Vita games that did this kind of gimmicky use of the, the, here in front screens, Roberto? A little bit. The funny thing is one of the ones I encountered was actually FIFA, where hmm. when you're up at goal, you can hit the back, and it would kind of map out in the goal where the shot was going to go. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah. I ended up turning it off because I kept shooting too early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing of those kinds of features. Like, Usually they, they kind of shove them in just to, to show that the the hardware features are there, but most people end up turning them off if they can or just not liking the game or liking the game less because they are there. I feel like that was probably one of the things that happened with Uncharted. That being said, there was there was one instance where I thought it was pretty amazing where it was something like Nathan Drake finds a piece of paper with some kind of hidden message that has been written with invisible ink or something like that. No usual uh, treasure hunt trope. Right. And basically what you have to do to be able to see what it's written on the paper is you got to take some, like a piece of light, like a piece of light, that doesn't make any sense, okay? Like, <laughs> you got to take your Vita under some light bulb or something and have the light hit it, like, right uh, right in the screen, and then it will show. And I thought that was pretty amazing. Although, like, it's, it's really gimmicky and it was only used in that part of the game, but holy shit, like, this this is super cool. Yeah, yeah. I would never have thought of that. Yeah. Let me see. Any other games that you, you feel like are worth mentioning? Probably the Dengarampa games, right? You like those. Right. That's another good series. But yet again, ports. Right. To be fair, they never came out in the West and Europe. But they are now, thanks to the Vita. I was also playing a little bit of the Vita version of Little Big Planet, But not a fan as well. Uh, not as much because of it being on the Vita. I'm just not a big fan of the series in general. I really like what they did with uh, with creating levels and being able to to share them with with people online and stuff. And that's that's the main reason why that game was so popular, in my opinion. But just the the basic platforming mechanics of that game, especially for me, that I, I'm super used to, you know, Mario platformers and Donkey Kong platformers just didn't work you know it's it's very floaty just feels kind of weird i can never really get used to that game uh have you have you ever played any of the shooters that are available on the vita kill zone uh call of duty surprisingly not and that was actually one of the main reasons i was excited for the twin sticks was oh shooters will be better because they don't have to do the hold r to lock on right which right. makes the game too easy or very difficult camera controls using the face buttons. Ugh. Yeah, we've we've seen a lot of those on the 3DS. So I know I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So we're talking about some of our, some of the games we like and stuff. What What do you think about the the Vita uh, in general, as far as how it did on the market? Poorly, very poorly. So, wh wh why would you attribute like the Vita's failure on the market? Would it be, Would it be essentially the lack of games, in your opinion? No. No. No, actually. The Vita 
is his own worst enemy. It's oh. too good. Right. That people don't want to develop for it because it's expensive. Right. I, I get your point. It's it's essentially it, like it would be having to spend a lot of money to make this very good looking game to show off the the best features of the platform to the point where it's not worth it to even start making it when it's a handheld handheld system. That's right. The other thing is Sony because True. they they really seem like they wanted to succeed but they just didn't try. Yeah. I, I totally agree. I'm actually very disappointed with Sony. I, uh, as I said, I did buy a Vita last year in like April or so, probably May, I don't know, before E3, because I was like, okay, this, this has a few games that I'm interested on playing right now, and I am a PlayStation Plus subscriber, so I did get a lot of them for free already, and it does sound like a, it does look like a really good device and everything. So I'm gonna buy it, and I'm excited to see where it will go next. And then on that E3 last year, I remember watching Sony's conference, which was cool. They talked a lot about the PS4 and everything, but I don't think there was a single mention of the Vita with the exception of the Vita being a PlayStation 4 controller or just like streaming uh, PlayStation 4 games to your Vita or something like that. And then you know what they me... did? Go ahead. They, they just did a montage of all the games that were going to come out. They didn't even bother to talk about a single one. Yeah, I, I remember that I, I did come out of that E3 conference being like, Shit, so are they gonna like kinda drop the Vita or like just hit it under the hide it under the mattress so that people forget that it exists or something? Cause as I said, like they yeah, and as you said as well, like they they barely, very barely mentioned it. And they did make it seem like it was more of a PlayStation 4 extension than a console on song, which I was very disappointed with, especially since I don't you know own a, a PlayStation 4 yet. Right. And the final, final nail in the coffin was honestly PS TV, where you can pretty much plug in your PS Vita games and play it right on your TV using a PS3 controller. Oh, yeah, I don't think most people know because, I don't know, like Sony's position as far as marketing, uh, both the, the PlayStation Vita for the longest time, and then even this PlayStation Vita TV thing was very weird. Like, they would bring it up at some points, but then not talk about it for like months. I really don't know what's going on in that matter, but... Well, regardless, I think the the Vita is a good device. It has a few games that uh, we really like. Is there anything else that you would like to mention before I move on, Roberto? No, I think that's, that's all I really have to say about it. It's a shame. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but whatever. We can keep rooting for it, although nothing's going to happen. We both know that, so we're kind of just crying on the inside. <laughs> um, all right, so since I mentioned that the PlayStation Vita uh, turned three years old, and it's not old to do anything, but the PlayStation 2 just turned 15 years old, and now it's old enough to drink here in Brazil. Or, no, okay, no. So, <laughs> no, actually, okay, because it should be 18, but if you're 15, they're probably going to sell drinks to you anyway. Especially if you have a mustache or something. Anyway, the PlayStation 2 released on March 4th, 2000, and it was uh, the best-sold console ever. For the longest time, I do think it got surpassed by the DS, the original DS, a while ago. Still, it was for sure the the, the best sold home console, and it had a lot of good games. Would you like to talk about some of your favorite PlayStation Two games as well, Roberto? Oh man, where do, where do I even begin with this? I mean, of course, there's got we got to talk about Kingdom Hearts, one of my oh, favorite okay. games of all time. I'm cool. expecting a lot of Square Enix stuff, yeah. Actually, I didn't. I didn't get that far in Square Enix with PS4. Okay. Because the thing is, with a lot of the Sony consoles, I I tend to pick them up at the end of their lifetimes. Oh. So I'm only kind of picking up the games that I can at the moment, and hopefully, getting through them as fast as I can. Right. So let's see, Kingdom Hearts. Okami was another really good one that I enjoyed. Do never got to finish it though. Yeah, I do have that for my Wii. Actually, I never got much far on it as well. And then let's see, Star Wars Battlefront was a was a really fun game. I don't know if you ever played that one. See, I remember play. See, the the PlayStation Two is kind of weird for me, especially because I did get it, but when I got it, I think I was like seriously like ten or eleven years old, and I was still at the point where I wasn't really choosing the games that I bought. Uh, I was still mostly just getting what I was given. And, and just rolling with it. And as a kid living in Brazil, you know, I got a lot of 
FIFA games. I, I played that a lot of, with my my family and everything. That's a cool game here because it's the kind of game that everybody plays. So if you get it and call your friends over, like everybody will want to play it and stuff. At least when you're 11 years old or whatever. I do remember that the very first game I got for my PlayStation 2, though, was Driver 3, which is kind of like GTA, but not GTA. <laughs> and I don't think most people play those games, but it was pretty good. I liked it. I mean, I was 11 years old killing people and driving cars, so that was cool. <laughs> Um, let me see. I played Gran Turismo 3, which was good. But, you know, like, uh, t the Tony Hawk games, uh, I like the, oh, yeah. the, oh, so you're a Tony Hawk fan as well. I just remember, like, old school Tony Hawk. Yeah. Me and my friends would stay up and make different maps and just try to break the game in every way possible. <laughs> yeah. Using cheat codes and stuff. Tony Hawk was fun. I don't even, like, quite remember, like, each one that I played and everything. I just remember that I played a bunch of them that I liked them a lot and... Kind of just like keep trying to learn the the dif different moves and everything, and uh, the Spider Man games as well. I used to like them, especially on the PlayStation One era, actually. But then I played a few on the PlayStation Two as well. And back then, I do think they were good games, but my memory could be tricking me. Anyway, most yeah, of I don't the... remember any of them other yeah. than the the ones based off the movie. Oh yeah, no, th those are bad. Those um, are always bad. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I did miss most of the PlayStation 2 masterpieces, I think, because I wasn't that big on, I wasn't that big on console gaming back then, you know, most of what I played was just online games on PC with, with my school friends and that kind of stuff. I was also starting to get a lot of into uh, internet communities and that kind of stuff at that point, and obviously school. And I feel like the, I remember playing it for a good amount, but just those random games that I was talking about. So, yeah, I never, like, I didn't play any of the Final Fantasy Persona games and that kind of stuff that most people tend to remember that console for, or even God of War or anything. Right. And did you ever play uh, the Budokai games from Dragon Ball? Mm, actually, no. Ah, uh, those are so fun. Because they were just so over the top, and <laughs> me and my friends got really competitive with it. That actually does sound like something that I would probably have loved as a kid. But, yep, never, Santa Claus never brought it. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, Dynasty Warriors Three was a, was a fun one. I don't know if you ever played that one. Nope, never played a Dynasty Warriors game. It's set for Hyrule Warriors. That's the same series, right? Yeah. Okay. Pretty sure. Just making sure I wasn't confusing it with something else. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the PlayStation Two really had so many greats, and I think that's what helped define it as a console. Also, that it could play DVDs, but. Oh yeah, actually minor details. <laughs> minor details. I think that's probably actually one of the biggest points in there because it was just a very cheap DVD player when DVDs were all over the place, right? And it's funny because the PS3 went through the same thing with Blu-ray. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just don't think people cared for Blu-ray as much as people cared for DVD back then. That's probably part of the reason why the PS3 didn't sell as much, nearly as much as the PS2. Also, the fact that. Um, Obviously, the PS3 was way more expensive when it released. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Because actually, Go I actually remember that di that fateful day when PS2 came out. Whoa. How was that? I remember it was, it was a bit of a rush. There was a lot of people scrambling everywhere in the store. And the thing is, we didn't even go to get me one. We actually went to get my cousin a, a console because he couldn't find one where he lived. Hmm. So we were helping him out, and I remember we managed to get one at, I think it was at, either at Toys R Us or at, like, Circuit City. That's a throwback. Sounds like a good story. And you did not, like, so you bought one for your cousin, and weren't you like, oh, mom, I also want one, or something? I don't I don't actually remember that much, Yeah. but I probably said, and my mom was like, no, that's too expensive, blah, Right, blah, blah, right. Blah. Yeah. Because $250 at the time was, was, right. was pretty expensive. Yeah. You don't strike me as a whiny kid, but you are the shortest of your family, I think. Or the youngest, sorry. <laughs> the well, youngest of your family. So I could see you, like, kind of, oh, why can I have one? <laughs> oh, no, trust me. There's plenty of, there was plenty of that. Okay. Anyway, that's it for the PS2. If you're a big PlayStation 2 fan and you think we didn't do the console justice, that's fine. Sound off in the comments below with, with your opinion. Or if there, well, if there is a comment section where you found this. If there isn't, you can reach us on Twitter at RGT Podcast or write an iTunes review with your feedback, which would help us a lot.
recently, uh, we, we talked about PS Vita, PlayStation 2. The PlayStation uh, 4 and the Xbox One and the Wii U, it is part of the generation, you like it or not, came out a few years ago. You know, one year ago for the, the two first ones that I, that I said, and then with the Wii U came out like two years ago. And since those consoles com came out, there were a lot of game releases that weren't really new game releases. They were just remastered, uh, definitive, remade editions of games from the previous generation or even before that. The reason why I brought the Wii U in here as well, though not a lot of people remember that, is because when it came out, it also had a lot of remakes, such as, uh, not really remakes, just more of re-releases. Uh, Batman, Batman Arkham City Armored Edition, Mass Effect 3 Special Edition, um, and a few other, I think Deus Ex something as well. And I, th I remember a lot of people gave it shit uh, back then. Oh, the Wii U only gets like the like versions of the old games and stuff. But now, where we, we saw the same trend with the other consoles as well, where, you know, Borderlands Handsome Collection just got announced, which is essentially Borderlands 2 plus Borderlands the pre-sequel. It doesn't include the first game, which is kind of weird, for the new consoles, plus, you know, GTA 5 released recently for the new consoles as well. Tomb Raider Definitive Edition released just like one year after the original game came out, I think. The Last of Us Remastered Edition, Halo Master Chief Collection, which I know is a collection of a lot of games, but I'm just throwing it in there. Uh, Metro Redux, which is a few of the Metro games, Metro Last Light, something else probably. Uh, DMC and Devil May Cry 4, I think it's been announced that they will be coming to the new uh, consoles as well. By the way, DMC is a great game, although most people have not played that. Uh, Resident Evil HD Remake just came out, which is I think is a remake of a remake. Lots of... Anyway, my point is a lot of uh, remakes are being released to those new consoles, and... Before I say anything, before I give my opinion on this matter, or even go through what most people are complaining or are not complaining about in this matter, Roberto, why do you, how do you feel about that? I actually kind of have mixed feelings about this. Okay. Because at times, yes, it can be good, and definitely there are people who are really excited. For example, I was really excited when Kingdom Hearts 2.5 HD oh, collection came out. I even out. forgot about that one. That's good. Yeah. Be well, the only difference is that they released the final mix edition of the game that was never released in the West. So that was a big part of it. Right. right. Mind you, still still an HD re-release for PlayStation 3. All right, but you were given something that you had no way to get before legally. So right. that's that's why oh, no, you I mean, like that one, right? Uh, besides, I could import it, but it's all right, in Japanese. Right. And then at the same time, I look at like Final Fantasy X and X2 HD, they just announced that's going to come out for PlayStation 4 so soon after coming out on PlayStation 3. Right. So in that regards, I, I don't think that's that's such a good thing. Right. No, I get your point. Uh, the thing that I found particularly interesting on this topic, and part of the reason why I wanted to bring to this uh, podcast, is that I, I, just, I, I just listed, like I don't know, like 10 games. And I feel like for most people, they will look at that and they'll be like, oh yeah, those six, fuck them, I don't want them to happen. And then those four, yeah, thank God they're coming, or whatever. And my point is, like, it seems like every person kind of has a different view of what they would like to be remade and what they wouldn't like to be remade. And they very, there are people who are very, like, vocal on the internet, like, oh, this company shouldn't be wasting time and resources doing this, they should instead be doing a different game. And although I see that point, and I do, you know, part of me does kind of agree with that, especially in the case like, you know, Tomb Raider Definitive Edition came out one year, uh, approximately one year after the original one. And I don't think they changed a lot. Uh, they changed her hair or something. Like they, I remember they made like a, a whole like video talking about how they made her hair physics better or something like that. Um, okay, so my my actual opinion is that. If you're taking a game and bringing it to a different audience or, or re-releasing it in a way that people who had not played the game before can now play it and it's a little better, I don't think there's any uh, bad thing to that. And I do support that they keep doing it, even with the games that I don't particularly care about. For example, Borderlands Handsome Collection, couldn't care less for that, honestly. I did play Borderlands 2, not all of it, but I did play it for a while with some friends. And granted, it was a fun game, but... I 
one, I don't really have interest in playing it again, and I have no interest on playing the the pre sequel game either. But if someone missed that on the Xbox or sixty or whatever or the the PS3, and now they own one of the new consoles, I do think it's fair that they're given the option. It's kind of a big point in here, right? You you don't necessarily have to buy them. You're giving the option. So they're giving the option to buy them on their new consoles a little better so that they don't have to like rehook everything in for their old shit and just turn their old shit on again and all that stuff. Like it, it's just, just a very like small convenient thing, but I, I do feel like it, it does more good than bad overall. I don't know. I feel like that specific example there. They're kind of too close, and even you can get those games on Steam. They're very readily available. Yeah, but maybe, maybe you're just not a PC guy, you know, or maybe you trade it, trade it in your Xbox 360 for an Xbox One, right? And now you want to play those games, and you don't have your Xbox 360 anymore, and you don't want to play it on PC or whatever. So you're just giving another option. And granted, how big is that audience? You know, that would actually fall into the category that I just described. Probably not very big, probably very small, and that's where, like, the bad side of, well, the company is wasting resources in doing this, right? Well, they could be wasting resources in, or not wasting, but they could be using those resources in making Borderlands 3, or whatever, which is what most people want. But I think we kind of just have to accept that we cannot control what those companies will do, and if they are doing that, it's because they made research enough to see that there's a market for it, and they're releasing to that market, and I personally think, whatever. You know, it's fine. If I wanted it, I would buy it. I don't want it. I'm just not going to buy it. And that's the way that I speak with my wallet of letting them know that, well, I don't want this. If there's enough people that don't want it, they'll stop doing it. If they keep doing it, it's just a sign that people still want that. You know, like, if if people keep buying those those remakes, they'll keep doing them because people like them. Very although, good. although they complain about the ones that they do not care about. Anyway. I know, I, I totally give you that point, but I feel like there's, I feel like there needs to be a little bit more of a gap in these right. kind of things. So, like, also, the new Pokemon came out, Omega Sapphire and, oh, or Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Good that you brought that up, yeah. yeah. See, there was a, a bigger generational gap between the, the Game Boy Advanced and the Nintendo 3DS. Huge difference, You get, we're, at, we're literally going from 2D to 3D, and it was actually very well executed while adding newer content on top. Right, yeah. From what I heard, it, and I, I actually wanted to ask you this, because I've played a few Pokemon games, and not a big Pokemon guy. I think you played all of them, right? Yes. Uh, as, long as, as far as the main series goes, yes. Yeah, so I did introduce Roberto as a Pokemon specialist, because he, he has played all of the major Pokemon games, and he has gone pretty far in all of them, I think. Like, he's probably beat all of them and done a lot of other stuff on them as well, and got, like, he probably caught all the Pokemon, uh, if that's even possible at this point, but... It is. <laughs> it is? Did you? It, really? I did not, but it, it, it certainly is. Okay. So, do you think that summing up all the Pokemon games that you played, and just considering, like, all the ones that you caught, like, all throughout the series, which percentage of the existing Pokemon do you think you've caught at least once? I think Gen 1 and Gen 2 are a lot of the repeatable Pokemon. Right. Because, you know, you've got Pikachu and Rattata that they always throw in everywhere. Right, right, Zubat. right. Freaking Zubats. Right. You know? So. And obviously, they're they're fan favorites, and they, they played in nostalgia, so of course they're going to throw them in into these games more than the, than the new ones. Right. Was there ever a game that had, like, I mean... Obviously, the original ones, but from the recent ones, they had all the Pokemon. Because I feel like well, they, they, or do they, I mean, in the actual world of the game. Because I, I, I remember looking at, like, the list of the Pokemon that you could catch in the world, and that was never, like, the total of Pokemon that exist. So, no, they haven't really done that, but they always make it so that you can catch the one, the new ones first, and then they'll expand Right, the, yeah, that's right. The game so that you can try to catch the other ones. Right. Anyway, I did play uh, Heart Gold, and then I was out for a while, and then Pokemon X and Y brought me back because they were doing the whole uh, graphic revamp and all that. And I played Pokemon Y. Uh, I played uh, at least the, the, the full story, and then I did a little bit of the extra stuff after that. And I really liked that one. But, you know, as I said, like it, it took me three years probably to, to get back to it. 
And after I got back, I was like, okay, I've had my share of this. I don't feel like I'm going to need to go through everything again on the next year. So, and then Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire came out. And granted, I never played the original games. I never played Ruby and Sapphire. Should I get those games, Roberto? Sell me them right now if you think <laughs> I should. Well, Hoenn, the, th- the third region, as it's called, is actually a little bit more of a, has more of a cult following for some than the first two games do. Right. It's, it's very, it's a very big region with a lot of water. So if you don't like I heard surfing, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it has a lot of HMs as well, so that's... But overall, it's very interesting that the two games are kind of parallel in the sense that you have two different villains and that they each play different roles in each game and they swap what happens. Unlike so that was the, that was a first for the series was two different outcomes for the same story. Hmm. That's that's very interesting actually. And it was a time when they they added a lot of mechanics that really changed the game, which was a uh, um Double battles and Pokemon abilities, natures, right? And all. So I can see that stuff. you know historically back then it added a lot of stuff. But considering that the last one I played was Pokemon Y, do you think is there enough difference between uh, Pokemon X and Y and this version to to justify someone who is not as big of a fan to to go and play it as well, play through them as well? I, I can't say there have been big changes other than the metagame itself. Whoa. If you were looking into more a competitive sense. Oh, okay. That by all means, because they did make a lot of new changes, new mega evolutions. I mean, hell, they broke the metagame with Mega Rayquaza. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll pretend I understand it. I, I, I remember who Rayquaza so, was, by the way. So they made him so powerful that they had to make a tier specifically f- just for him. Oh, that's weird. Because <laughs> he was he's so broken. The Yeah, I play Pokemon very casually. You did call me a casual player before, and that's true. Um, I I normally make my team based on how cool I think the Pokemon are, and <laughs> not on how like, powerful <laughs> they are or anything. So I remember the Pokemon Y, one of my favorites was Exeggutor, because, and it's probably useless uh, competitively, I don't know. But on the I, I remember that when I watched... And that was purely nostalgia. When I watched the Pokemon anime, and there was the ex- like the Exagator episode that showed like the little eggs and whatever, and they become I don't remember the the original name of the the first execute. Evolution. Yeah, execute and uh, she'll turn into Exagator. And I was like, holy shit! It's a fucking coconut tree. Like they're eggs that become a coconut tree. What 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 is the, how does that even make sense? And like for some reason that like that was one of the Pokemon that just stuck out the most to me from from that first season and i don't know all the time that when i thought about pokemon i kind of thought about him for some weird reason and when i played pokemon y i found an execute at one point I was like holy shit it's here i gotta catch this and then i caught it and made it made him into an executor and i kept like just bringing him with me it was cool put other pokemon just leap i like that all right i don't know um there are a lot of remakes. There are some that are better than others. I get both sides. I get your opinion. My opinion is still over. I was like, whatever, just let them do it. I don't give a shit. But I agree. Uh, they are harmful to a degree, and they are good to a degree, and every person is going to look at them differently. My recommendation is simply, and I think you would agree with this part at least, that you know, if you if you if you like the remake and you think the developers made a good job of improving the game then buy it to show that you know that you like it and that they should keep doing that and if you're disappointed with a remake or you think that it shouldn't exist because there's almost no difference then just fucking don't buy it right well here's a here's a point that I think we didn't really talk about so you know what would you say is one of the most demand games right now to be remade okay what let me think this? i think this is a tricky question no, no, it should be, should be pretty straightforward. Okay. What is one of the most, uh, one of the games that people want the most to be remade? All right. right. So I think Final Fantasy VII, possibly. Bingo. Yeah. That's the one. Okay. That's now, the one. All right. I was going to say Super Mario 64, maybe as well. No, no. Okay. So <laughs> a lot of, this is a, so many things on the internet have spoken about how much they want 
Final Fantasy VII Remade that, you know, that Square Enix could totally do this and they're just being butts about it and they don't want to do it. At first, they they kind of try to play it off that, oh, you know, it, it would cost us too much money to, you know, to... And clearly that's not true, seeing how much they spent on right, the 13 right. series as a whole and the money they spent to rebuild 14 from the ground up. I mean, and then they tried to say, well, if Lightning Returns sells a crap ton of copies, maybe we'll redo it, you know? But right. Obviously, that, that game wasn't going to sell a lot of copies. Right, right. And I think it, it finally came down that they said, well, the reason, the real reason they don't want to do it is because they think that the game will lose its original feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do think that makes sense. That That's probably the case. And, you know, like, it is an excuse, probably, but taking something that people really, really like and remaking it can be a very tough job. And they're probably afraid to take that risk, you know? Exactly. To take the risk of possibly ruining a masterpiece. Which, in a way, was the risk that Nintendo took with Ocarina of Time 3D, and later Majora's Max 3D. But, yeah, I, I can see why they would, one should be careful with that. Although, if it was well done, it would probably sell a lot. Obviously. Yeah. Right. But if it's not, then it's just be a disaster. Okay, I think this is enough for the to talk about remakes. Uh, as you can see, Miro Bardo is saying a little bit of different sides of the story here. Oh, actually, probably in the inside, we still have a bit of the same feels. We just like to express the all the, the different sides that relate to the story. And it was great because we were able to bring a lot of different things to the table so that the listeners can take their own opinions. And again, if you do have an opinion, listener, please email rgtcast at gmail.com and rgtpodcast on Twitter. Take a look at that so that you can um, follow everything that we're doing and give us feedback on how we can improve and also say, you know, what you think about the issues that we're handling in here. So I'm curious because I have not bought a, I have not bought a next gen console yet, except for the, the Wii U, but the, between the Xbox One and the PS4, I'm about to buy one. I'm planning on buying one in, in April, but I have not bought one yet. I'm curious, which which one did you buy, if any, Roberto? I ended up getting the Xbox One. Oh, okay. So, why did you get the Xbox One rather than the PS4? Why did you decide to go against the flow when it seems like the great majority of people seem to be going with the PS4 so far? So, well, the first thing is, I was actually leaning more towards the PS4 pending the announcement of Kingdom Hearts 3. And when that announcement finally came out, they said it would be multi-platform. Oh. So that kind of just set me right back in the middle between the two. Right. But the real reason I got it was my friends. I've made a good group of friends online that I strictly only know through Xbox. And I just didn't want to lose those connections. Oh, okay. I do remember that. Because Roberto is the kind of guy who plays every Call of Duty game, right? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, okay. So you're still you're still on that trend. Did you play the the last few ones as well? I I did pick up Advanced Warfare strictly because my friends <laughs> don't oh. want to play other games. I'll be honest. I'm not a Call of Duty player. I I, I almost picked up Advanced Warfare, uh, just because of strictly because of Kevin Spacey. Is he good on it, or did you even play the the campaign? I, I didn't even touch oh, the okay. campaign. All right. <laughs> I usually do though. But for whatever reason, I just haven't had the time to do it. Okay, that's fine. Going straight to what you actually care for. So is that like the the only reason? Because your f- friends were playing on Xbox One, you went with it, or you probably didn't even put that much as much thought at that point, right? But do do right. you think like the Xbox One has better exclusives or just like a better lineup of games in general by this point or something like that? I mean, reiterating back, the one exclusive I wanted ended up being multi-platform. Right. And now the other one, Final Fantasy XV, is also multi-platform, so it didn't really matter at that point. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually in the middle as well. And to me, I think it's weirder because I've always been a PlayStation kid, or actually more of like a Nintendo slash PlayStation. I've always owned, you know, like either Nintendo or PlayStation consoles or both or whatever. 
uh, I had a PlayStation 1, 2, and 3. And especially with everybody, you know, like, being super hyped about the PlayStation 4 since the release and everything, I should probably be leaning more towards the PlayStation 4. But I just feel like so far, you know, although it's it's the best sold console, I don't think it has really justified why, you know, it, it should be. Except for, like, that really good E3 presentation and everything. I mean, they, they were great at their marketing. But I haven't seen any, like, exclusive games for the PlayStation 4 that I'm really, really interested on, you know? And granted, not for the Xbox One as well, but part of me kind of wants to try a few of the Xbox exclusives, you know? I never played any Halo game, so part of me looks at Master Chief Collection and goes like, oh shit, that's like a great opportunity to jump in and just play all of them, you know? Or I heard a lot of good things about Sunset Overdrive and that game looks really good. And then Tomb Raider, which, you know, I loved the, late, uh, the latest Tomb Raider, and this one looks like it's going to be really good, and supposedly it is an Xbox exclusive. So, yeah, I'm really in the middle. I don't know what console I'm going for yet. Although, here's the hard part. Even though the Xbox One so far has had a little bit more attractions, in my opinion, like there's a little more things in there that I'm attracted to, even the Kinect thing with controlling the, the interface with your voice and everything. How, do, how did that work for you, by the way? Pretty well, actually. It helps me be lazy. Oh, okay. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So but, you, you did get the Connect version. Yes, I I do actually enjoy being able to just say Xbox on and it turns on my TV, turns on the console. Right. And, you know, I I don't have to be switching cables constantly. See, I did like that, and I do think I actually do think a lot of people are kind of unfair with uh, with Microsoft back then because. They, they made that come first that a lot of people made fun of, oh, TV, 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 Xbox, uh, like, uh, what was it? Oh, yeah, TV, 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 sports, 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 Call of Duty, Call of Duty, Call of Duty, right? I don't know if you've seen that video. They got, like, the yeah, Xbox conference, they I just cut, cut out, like, the, the words that they said the most. But aside from, from their mistakes in that conference, there was actually, like, something really cool being shown in there, in my opinion, you know, like, the whole, like, interaction with the TV and... And being able to switch between the different applications just through your voice or just like a very simple interface and all that. What it seemed like a very simple interface. I, I was actually kind of excited. And before I saw, you know, all the jokes on the internet, I had not actually realized that it was as bad as people made it seem, you know. Uh, so I do think, especially because of obviously Microsoft's own mistakes and Sony's way of uh, taking advantage of those mistakes, Everyone kind of got into this this hype way towards PS4 without really thinking that much about it, and 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 just going, you know, oh, everybody's talking about the PS4. All those videos are making fun of the Xbox One. PS4 is cool. Xbox One is meh. Let's go, everyone with a PS4. And I think that's why the PS4 succeeded. I do not necessarily think it is actually the best console with the best uh, option of games. I think that still should be decided. And. As I'm still in the middle and like, oh man, like maybe that would be a good, this would be a good point to jump into the Xbox One. At the same time, I love the Uncharted series. I love The Last of Us. And when those games come out, I'm going to want a PS4. So I still don't know. But what do you think in general, Robert, of this like new generation of consoles? I mean, like, do you think they, they reached the point that you wanted them to reach? I think they're starting to hit their ceiling. How much further can we really push the hardware to the point where it's just a little bit better, a little bit better every time, and we're we're dishing out five hundred, six hundred dollars for the next thing, you know? Because at that point, you might as well just build your own PC. Right. Right. A PC is probably still way more expensive. It still right? is, but. I, I get what you're saying, especially, you know, looking to what the future of consoles will be. And comparing, you know, for example, you know, the, when the PlayStation 1 went to the PlayStation 2, there was a notable difference that everybody could see, you know. And then PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3, there was, again, uh, kind, kind of a, a big difference, especially for people who understand about games. But, but not you know, as big. But not as big. You know, your mom probably wouldn't notice. And, you know, especially yeah. considering the first PS3 games. Uh, and I say that because I remember my mom was like... Why did you buy this for? It's the same thing. <laughs> um, and then the PlayStation 3 to the PlayStation 4, I think it gets to the point where it's only like a few games that actually make a good use of it. And even those few games, it's like, 
you kind of have to like pay close attention to to know that there's there's a difference in there, and a lot of people wouldn't know. And again, like if you put them side by side, oh, okay, this one looks better. I can see that in ninety percent of the games, but if I just see the game and I haven't seen the other version, I don't I don't even think I can clearly tell if it is a PS3 or like a really good PS3 game or an early PS4 game, you know. And especially in granted, I'm talking PS PlayStation, but it applies to Xbox as well, obviously. I look at something like The Last of Us on PlayStation 3, and even GTA 5 and PlayStation 3, and I think those games looked gorgeous. Like, they looked amazing. And when I look at, you know, those same games on PlayStation 4, or even, like, other games on PlayStation 4, I don't think they look much better, or even just better, you know? Um, there's very... They talk a lot about, like, how it's not just looks, it's about putting more stuff on, in the screen as well, but... What do you really gain from that in a lot of cases? Right. You know, they made a huge deal about Assassin's Creed Unity. Look, there are like a hundred people on the screen or whatever, like thousands of people on the screen. I don't know. Okay, how does that make the game better? I honestly don't really know the answer to that question. I mean, look at the Order 1886. Right. Most Probably the most beautiful game out there right now. But from what I've heard, Not the gameplay great. suffered... The story suffered, right? Because all the effort went into trying to max out graphics, you know. Right, and I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people are talking. Uh, I heard a lot of people saying that the order was bad or just not as good as people expected it should be, but that it's gonna there's gonna be a second one that's gonna be amazing or whatever. Because uh, apparently the game has a big cliffhanger in the end, and Sony invested a lot of money on this franchise and they want to make more games with it, but. Would people even care if there was a second game, considering, like, they didn't like the first one? I don't know. They keep coming back to, like, the Assassin's Creed example, where the first one wasn't that great, and then the second one was good, you know? But, I don't know. I just don't know for how long they're going to keep, like, being able to do that, where they just, like, release something that's all right, and that it's going to keep selling. Right. I mean, it's those kind of things that they just have to try, but now that not, it doesn't always work out. Right. Because the reality is... Graphics don't sell games. Let's let's just throw that out there. Okay, yeah, that's a good obviously. Point. You you also you cannot just not try and make the game look horrible. But I mean, it, there there are certain limitations, and we understand those. I mean, take like a look at Xenoblade Chronicles, for example. The right. game looks at times looks really terrible to the eyes, but it is probably one of the best JRPGs made within the last 10 years. Oh, easily that's a bold outshines, statement. And it easily outshines any AAA game that has released within the last five years, even with all their fancy graphics and whatnot. Right. Oh, I hear you. There, I, I do feel like there's still, unfortunately, a few people, and when I say a few, I mean, actually, I actually mean a bunch, that do look at a game and are like, oh shit, this looks fucking amazing, and go and buy it. You know? Uh... Granted, those are not people that we should call, like, gamers, in my opinion. Or even, I don't even like that, that naming convention it's still, but that's probably why, like, the... I mean, the, the, probably the reason why they still push graphics so much is because there's still, like, a market that goes for it and kind of gets tricked by it. But especially today with, like, so many uh, review sites and everything, and I think, I think every day, like, there are more people looking into what they're purchasing and researching before they purchase... There's going to be a point where they're simply not going to work anymore in no extent, you know? So, I totally agree with you. Gameplay should always triumph. I'm all about gameplay over graphics. I mean, some of the best games that I played last generation were on the Wii. So, I fucking love the Mario Galaxy games. Xenoblade Chronicles that I talked about is on the Wii, although I haven't played that one. Didn't get that one. So. Anyway, do you think... Uh, but... Alright, so you think the consoles didn't really, like, have bigger improvements compared to their predecessors, and I agree with that. You think that virtual reality could be what takes them to the next step? I mean, at this point, I want to say yes. A lot well, of people laughed at the Kinect when it came out, but personally, I felt it was a big stepping stone, you know? Right. We have to start somewhere, and obviously mapping people's bodies with cameras is probably the right idea. You know, and the Nintendo 3DS had the AR system and 
right. while not very big, it's something. Right. See, yeah. there was a time when I had just bought the Nintendo 3DS where there wasn't le- really any game release that I was interested on yet. And I actually played a lot with those AR games. Or, not a lot. But for, for a few days, at least, I played a good amount with those AR games and stuff. And they they were actually very interesting at the time. You know, just, like, ex- very experimental and everything. But just, like, playing them and, and trying to think about, oh, all the things that they could do, you know, using that kind of functionality was cool. And then, you know, as kind of expected, to be honest, kind of faded out and decided to focus on their bigger franchise and not do anything with that again. But I'm also big, like, I also have a lot of respect for the Kinect. I do think, like, it was a big stepping stone. And I actually, that's something hard to say, but I actually do kind of feel like Microsoft maybe should have stuck to their guts and kept including the the Kinect on every Xbox One box. Because I feel like that would... I feel like... Uh, how can I how can I put this? It, it hurts the developers more. Exactly. So. Yeah, that's that's where I'm trying to get it. Like making sure that every user of your machine has the same thing is really good for developers because they can make stuff. That, like they're comfortable to make st- games that take advantage of all of those features because they're guaranteed to be there. You know. And at the point that they did that, at the point that they released the Xbox without the Kinect, while being probably a necessary move, a lot of people would argument that, and I, I partially agree, that also means that, you know, Kinect development is pretty much done. Because from now on, there will be way more people buying Xboxes, Xbox Ones without Kinect than with Kinect, probably. And that means that if you do make a Kinect game, you'll have a very limited audience that is essentially just those early adopters plus the people who bought a Kinect uh, separately afterwards. We're probably not going to be a lot of people. Granted, for the uh, Dance Central, Jazz Dance crew, like for the, for that target audience, probably doesn't make that big a difference because I, th- I think the people who would play those games are buying a Kinect regardless, you know, if it being included in the box or not. But it just means that, like, it makes it a lot harder for a developer once you experiment with it. Anyway, I don't want us to get like too far into this uh, digression. Going back to VR, though, we had initially Oculus VR, which is, was the one that was purchased by Facebook in early last, last year. And then uh, Sony Morphil got announced as well, which is the, the Sony version. Microsoft HoloLens recently, which kind of a different thing. I'm not sure if it could be included, but I'm, I'm, I'm including it as it's, well, I think. It's more AR than VR. All right. But it's interesting as well. And uh, now I... Last I heard in this GDC, just Valve and HTC just announced the HTC Vive, which is just another uh, competitor. Have you ever tried any of those, Roberto? I did. I've actually used the Oculus Rift once. Right. It wasn't a, a specific tech demo. It was just someone who built their engine alongside the the Oculus Rift. And my, my first impressions of it were... We're pretty good, I think. You know, it was solid. When I turned my head, I could see within my own visual radius, right, and whatnot. Well, what exactly did you experiment with it? Like, what do you mean with an engine? So, someone was just demoing their engine. It wasn't anything really. Like, I could walk around, shoot, jump, and turn around. Oh, okay. So that's something. Like that. Yeah, I was just curious of like, yeah. why were your actions? Um, like, if you feel, if you felt like good. Uh, yeah. While you were doing them. Yeah, yeah. As far as what I what I saw and the response from the system to the to the glasses were were pretty straightforward. Right. You didn't want to throw up or anything. Myself personally, no. Okay. It, I, it does vary from person to person, honestly. Right. I did test the Oculus Rift at one point as well. It was in 2013, by the end of the year, on Indicade, Los Angeles. And I like they did this thing where like I actually wish I had tried one of the legit Oculus demos that they've made. I also tried something more simple, kind of like yours. I think they I think they they did a game jam with a few college students or something, and they they each had a weekend to make an Oculus game or whatever. And then I played one of those games, and basically in, th- in that game I was an elephant, and I had to use my is it Trump? Like the yeah, elephant note? Okay. The trunk. Yeah, trunk. Okay. And I had to use my trunk to, like, as I moved my head, I would shake my trunk, and I had to use that to destroy a, a city made of colored blocks or something like that. 
I didn't think it was an amazing experience, but I think it's mostly because of the game I played. And sorry for someone who worked on that game. I I I I know how game development works, and I I'm sure it was a lot of work to get that done and everything. But just as a demo, it wasn't like the I I don't think it was the best way to demonstrate like the. The system and granted, I could see like the responsiveness was good and all that, but you know, all I, I was doing was shaking my head, and that was all. There was no controller or anything, and it was a little hard for me at the time to kind of like figure out, you know, like try to adapt my experience to oh, what what would this be like in a in a real game, you know? But so yeah, I I don't think I I would like to have tested more of it. I would like to have tested other demos and that's that kind of stuff. I think it has potential. I'm still really not sure how it's going to reach mass market, especially in terms of pricing and compatibility. You know, like what kind of soft device is, is this going to be compatible with or if it's going to be its own thing. Right. I think the, the biggest challenge that VR is going to have is immersion. Hmm. You know, how many things can you wear until you feel like you're really in the game, you know? Right. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that's the hard part for me because, like, yeah, you put this glasses on and you're kind of in the game. But if you still need to use like a video game controller to control yourself, I'm not sure how realistic that is and how much of an improvement that is over what we already do. If they got to the point, I'm sure we're super far away from that. Where it's like Sword Art Online, where you put an helmet on and you're in the game. Yeah, that would be right. fucking amazing. But you know, obviously. We're not going to get there, at least not anytime soon. I feel like the the closest thing we got to like full immersion so far is I and I don't know if you've seen that, but it's like it's like a stand that you walk on, and as you walk, like the stand, um, like kind of like this. How can I say this? The stand is a lot. It slides through your feet as you like walk. Like a treadmill. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're like, yes. yeah, but it's it's more like digital, you know, like it's not a super <laughs> right, right, right. Like I know that. exactly what you're talking about. Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah, that thing, and I wish I knew the name of that thing. I should probably have done more research. I'm going to do more research for the next episode, guys. That is one thing that I thought looked pretty good. That seems like that would be way more immersive than using a controller to move yourself. But at the same time, I keep wondering, like, how much is that going to cost, man? Like, how, how much and how much would you be willing to spend to have that whole kit? Or maybe just to have an Oculus Rift? I'm curious why you have to say on that. I mean, again, it comes to how far of a level of immersion you can really take with it. It also comes with, you know, if I get one piece, what what else do I need? Do I need to get this? Do I need to get that? You know? Right, yeah. Is it going to work on this machine? Will it not work on this machine? What about games? What games can I play with it? Is it strictly Oculus developed games? Or can I put in whatever game, I don't know, Call of Duty right now, play that on Oculus? That's kind of going to be the bigger selling point to me, I feel. Yeah. See, the whole put any game you want thing, I don't think that will ever happen. And it's actually because I don't think, as much as it's good to think about it, how can I put it? I, I think that for a game to work with Oculus and feel comfortable in Oculus, it cannot be any game. You know, that that's the point I, uh, I want to make. Yeah. Because first thing is to adapt a game to Oculus, you do have to adapt a lot of stuff like uh, the HUD, you know, the heads-up display and everything, because it cannot be where it usually is, or you would have, like, to keep, look, like, looking up all the time. You know, so I, I heard about, like, games where they went to adapt to Oculus Rift. They had to put, like, the HUD on a three-dimensional space in front of you, kind of far away, and, you know, they have to adjust, like, a, a lot of elements of the game design have to be slightly adjusted, or a lot, adjusted a lot to make the game work. And not just the game work, but to make people comfortable playing them. But at the same time, you know, I keep wondering, like, maybe the reason why it is that disorienting for some people and the reason why they, they feel bad is maybe this thing isn't really meant for big, uh, fast-paced action games. Because if you actually are fully immersed, all right, and you actually feel like in the middle of a Call of Duty scene where there are, like, fucking bombs dropping everywhere, grenades being thrown, you're being shot by, like, AK-47s and everything... I'm not sure if that would actually feel like good and comfortable in if you're actually if you actually feel in that situation. And something I like to go back to in that point is, you know, when when touch was first implemented on cell phones and with the iPhone and everything, there were a lot of games that tried to just adapt 
usual, you know, like PC console games to touch interfaces, and it turned out not that good. And the first games to be successful on the mobile devices were the ones that were made ground up for that device, and that were, you know, good quality for that kind of control scheme. So Angry Birds and Fruit Ninja and, you know, Infinity Blade and a few others. They were games that were built for that control scheme and that worked really well for that control scheme. So something that I keep asking myself, wouldn't the best games for VR be games that are actually made ground up for VR? When you put it that way, I, I, I definitely have to agree. Because you're right, you can't just force something to be this way. It's, it's got to have to come naturally. Right. And granted, like, I think developers are smart enough to, like, they, they probably, yeah, they probably could figure out a way to make, you know, Call of Duty work, to make, uh, I don't know, like, all those other Valve games work and that kind of stuff, but how good would that be? Maybe, maybe you'll play it and you'll be like, alright, this is interesting, but I still prefer playing it on my controller, you know, like, on my controller, on my TV, or whatever. And I think that it's, it's the original experiences that could potentially blow, blow our minds. And that's what I'm waiting for to see if this thing's gonna like I, I think that that's obviously there are a lot of reasons probably logistic reasons for this to to work or not but i think one of the big ones also is what kind of experience are they gonna make that you can only experience through this device that is amazing you know how are right. they gonna blow our minds with an experience made from the ground up for this device and without being too gimmicky exactly yeah that's another thing as well well, right now, I think possibly one of the bigger contenders for VR would have to be survival horror. Oh. Amnesia, Five Nights at Freddy, you know. Yeah. Types of games where you're not as in control as you are the environment around you, you know. Right, right. No, I, I, I get it. Like, especially because those games are usually, like, at least they're not supposed to be very fast-paced, you know, so you kind of have, like... You kind of have the time to look around and observe everything and just calmly, like, go through it and, like, plan our, your actions wisely. But at the same time, you know, shit happens. You probably get really scared, you know, if, if done right. Um, yeah, I would be really curious to see how, how that would go. Price, I think, for... Obviously, it depends a lot on what they accomplish and how it works. But I'm already kind of thinking about that because I think Sony announced that their VR uh, Morphil... It's going to release on 2016. I think they said that at GDC. So they're probably already thinking about that. And if it is something, if it's an accessory that works with the PlayStation 4, and you're already spending, you know, like, probably at that point, 350 or 300 bucks on the PlayStation 4 or whatever, max 400 if it's still the same, um, how much would you know, people be willing to, to, to spend extra to use this? And I think I'd be willing to spend up to probably 200 bucks, actually as an accessory and if it was something that worked by itself or that worked with pc probably a little more but yeah i don't think i would be able to like drop full like console price on this yet right there's there certainly needs to be a lot more to it than just oh hey you can do things with it but we're still kind of waiting on something big right and uh i feel like we've probably uh Got enough of the stuff. We're kind of running out of time. But just, just just finish it up. Just uh, in your based on your intuition, do you think this will ever actually reach mass market, or do you think it will be just like I don't know, like kind of a coat thing? I think it can definitely reach it, but it needs the proper execution and time. Time's the biggest factor, yeah, obviously. Yeah. And just how far are we willing to push innovation? Not just, oh, what's what's the next level of exponential technological growth, like better graphics, better processing, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Creativity really needs to be the biggest part of this to make it work. Right. Very well put, sir. Very well put. And with that, I think it's time to close off this podcast. This has been Real Game Talk. Are you curious about well, why I named it that, by the way? Probably not. Go. Probably don't give a shit. But. Go ahead. No, <laughs> All right. tell me. You so, brought it up. Okay, so the initial idea was that this was supposed to be like... I was supposed to do something like uh, while everybody else is just like... Are just like fanboys and just like talking shit without really thinking. This is supposed to be real talk where like we're actually going to 
know what we're talking about. I don't know. There's not really like a very like deep reason, but it just made sense in my head at one point. We're like, yeah, this is like we're we're gonna come here together and like think about like serious topics because games are supposed to be taken seriously. Break them up and just like give our like real opinion on them and that kind of stuff. So kind of just like coming out of like the usual like oh here are the news or just like fanboy wars and stuff and just like a more open though real and honest and serious talk about stuff so that, that was the original idea anyway if you like the real game talk you can subscribe to us on itunes our podcast is supposed to post every thursday if i do my job right which i probably won't and you can leave us a review if you like the podcast if you didn't like you should as well and just tell, tell us what's wrong the idea is that i'm gonna have different guests here every week possibly more people than just you today i got my friend roberto in here Next time, I may get someone else, or he may come back again, I think. Did you enjoy the experience, Roberto? Will you come back? I did. I did. Thank you for having me, Dan. Okay, no problem. So, me personally, you can reach me at Lima Daniel M on Twitter. You can see RGT at RGT Podcast on Twitter for podcast content. And, Roberto, where can we find you? You can also find me on Twitter at RJR2992. Nice. Very slowly, but just to make sure you get it right. Uh... <laughs> So you can reach Roberto at RGR tonight, and she, like he said, and you can reach, you can actually see both of us in a podcast about anime. So if you're also interested in anime and you want to see or like, us like dissecting different shows that we do every week, you can check out the pseudo random podcast at pseudo random podcast.wordpress.com, or you can just look for pseudo random podcast on iTunes or pseudo underscore pod on Twitter. And that is a lot of fun as well. We are joined by CJ is the host of that show which is a friend of ours, and also Aaron Klecker is another big friend of ours as part of the show. You're probably going to like that a lot. So, okay, with that said, that's it for the today's show. Keep it tuned for the next episode next week. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>